Let's play a game, a quiz if you will. What car produced over 5.3 million units, became a racing icon, and had a production run of just over 50 years, yet barely made it to our shores here in America? Well, if you guessed the original Mini, you're correct. We only got these cars from 1960 to 1967, and only around a mere 10,000 units officially sold here in the United States. After new emissions and safety regulations appeared for the 68 model year, which would have required major redesigns to the cars for the US market, and the British car industry in whole was taking a major financial hit from rivaling European brands, the Minis were pulled from our shores, never to return again, until the major BMW buyout and redesign in 2002. So what did we miss out on for those 40 years? Let's travel back to 1957. The Suez crisis is in full swing, causing fuel shortages and spiked prices all across Europe, and in this case, Great Britain. Being that gasoline was in short supply, British citizens had long since embraced smaller forms of transport to save fuel from the likes of the Italians and the Germans. This was much to the dismay of the ironically named British motor company overlord, Leonard Lord who vowed to rid the streets of the foreign vestiges by creating what he called a proper miniature car. He outlined several parameters, namely that the car had to be able to be contained in a 10 foot by four foot by four foot box, the passenger compartment needed to be six feet of that space, and to make matters more difficult, it had to use an existing engine to save cost. All of these problematic outlines and more fell into the lap of BMC designer Alec Sagonis and a team of eight other individuals to find an inventive way to make it work. And invent they did, utilizing a transverse engine mounting solution to save space, making the transmission part of the engine's oil pan, and designing rubber cones to act as suspension bushings. All of which eventually culminated in what was dubbed the Orange Box, or the prototype for what became the original Mini. Originally introduced in 1959 as either the Austin 7 or Morris Mini Minor, the Mini quickly became a British family icon found all across Europe and even America up until 1967. And with the help of the Cooper Car Company from 1961 until 1971, you could get them in all sorts of zesty motorsport inspired varieties for on the road or at the track. At the same time Ford was turning up the heat on Ferrari to boil them like a pot of spaghetti, the Cooper Minis were mopping the floor of their contemporary sized foes, winning the prestigious Monte Carlo Rally in 64, 65, and 67. Several other rally championships dominating at touring car racing, endurance racing, saloon car racing, and Trans Am racing. Do you get the picture yet? If it's motorsport related, a Mini most likely competed in it and probably did well. Over the course of 41 years and seven generations, dozens of variations were created from the sporty Cooper S to the utilitarian country. These endearing little cars found loving homes all across the world, and we've got two very different examples to show you here today. I'm so excited, because this was my first right-hand drive car right here. Yeah. So you'll get to see how that went in just a moment. It was mostly good, um, but we have lovely, lovely cars. We are in a different setting than the last time you saw us. We have opposite cars compared to what we had back then. We had five large Audis. All things considered, they were generally large, especially in comparison to what was the original micro car. Yeah, really. Exactly. You know, and those also had twice the engine by cylinder count and way more than twice the engine <laughs> oh my God. By, by sheer size. Well, you have 998cc right here, and then behind me you have 1275cc. We'll call it 1275 Spicy, which we'll talk about why it's spicy. We'll, we'll get to that later. It's called the 1275 GT for those of you that uh, actually have knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, we're going to start off with the black with white striped beauty behind me and see what right hand drive minis in America is all about. You join me today on a, a momentous occasion. Um, I've driven many weird things in my life. I used to drive semis for a living. I've driven my Saabs. I've driven a Rossi on Q1, etc. Never have I driven something quite like this for two reasons. Uh, this is a 91 <laughs> original Mini with the 998cc carbureted engine. Um, that's part one of the weirdness, is that this car could fit inside my Sequoia that we use as a camera vehicle. Part two is that I'm here, not over on the left hand side. Yeah, um, so this is going to be, you now witnessing, my first time driving a right hand drive car. And we're gonna hope that I don't stall it. All right, this is already so wrong. 
Oh. Oh, I love the bumps. <laughs> you feel everything to a degree. It's for how small it is, it's actually smoother than you expect, albeit still bouncy. Um, we are currently full throttle, going uphill in third, doing about mm, 35. She's pitter-pattering. Let me back up before I continue on my tirade. Right-hand drive car my first time. Um, especially in something like this where I'm forced so far over to the window is a weird experience. I'm having to get used to judging, you know, that side of the road while maintaining driving in this side of the road, which is completely opposite of normal, on a car that I have never driven anything quite this slow, with a nardy wheel, pedals that are closer to the middle of the car than the right-hand side, and on top of that, a car that weighs only 1,500 pounds. So this is about as unique of an experience as I can get with a number plate and still maintain some civility. It's, you know, obviously it's not a the experience you get of a race car for the road that has a number plate on it, but this is very unique here in America. Also, I'm gonna go for a downshift. Oh, no, that was a fourth. Got it. This thing is a lot of fun. Going through like little hairpins like this, keep it pinned, and you can really tell like the old sense of occasion of, you know, the uphill racing it in the British Isles where you just kind of keep it pinned, let the front front end grab, rotate around a little bit. And we're gonna kind of give these bikers a little bit of room here. There we go. But then you just turn in, pull to the corner, give it as much as you can. And when you have to slow down like that, you don't have much of an option. This is a, uh, either you'd either call it a gravity mod car or you could also call it a momentum car. It moves, it handles. This one has a few modifications, namely some upgraded brakes, thicker tires as far as inside to outside dimensions, and some small little things, almost more mild Restamod style. It's definitely not heavily modified. The engine is still very stock. It is still carbureted, hasn't been updated to the later fuel injection models. As I said in the intro, it's a 998cc engine, so less than a liter. It's tiny, just a lot of little grip, a lot of little bounce, not even any shock absorbers, just some rubber pegs. About as simple as you can get, and it definitely, <laughs> this is one of those cars similar to my Saab that def you can feel that this car originated in the 50s, not in the 90s when this car was built, and definitely not in the year 2000 when the last of these was built. It's crazy to see, think that a car like this was built at the same time Audi is building a car that I used to own, which is a 1991 220 valve Avant with all of the nannies, plus turbocharging, plus four times the power and all wheel drive. It's hilarious that this was still made. And I love it. Like everything about this car comes with a compromise, but that is what makes it perfect. You can tell that, you know, even from engineering standpoint, when they were building it to fit the engine in, especially an engine that needed to be an existing power plant, they had to make the transmission the sump of the engine. So they share the same oil. That obviously is gonna have a lot of potential problems. Obviously the reason the pedals are over to the left, like I mentioned, is simply because the wheel well is right there. If I was able to stamp through the floor of this car, I would hit the wheel. I could break like a Flintstone if I was able to put my foot down right here just by using my shoe. On top of that, like the steering wheel is not adjustable, comes out at a jaunty angle, almost halfway to like bus flat. And you know that there's no other way they could have done it. Every single thing was like, okay, this is all we have to work with is 10 foot by four foot by four foot. We got to do whatever the crap we can to make it fit. And that's what made this car such a riot. It's tiny, it's chuckable. Everything about it gives so much more of a sense of occasion than you could get out of almost any newer cars. Just because everything is right there, there's no room for, you know, the upper echelon styles of like having any sort of sound deadening in this thing. The sound deadening is the metal. <laughs>
no AC, no like really vents to your face except this one little one right here, a little bit of defrost, some wipers, and that's about all the luxuries you got. Not even a radio. But you do have a beautiful little soundtrack, this tiny little engine that makes, depending on the generation, between 40 and 50 horsepower, really does sing a pretty good little tune. And luckily, you get to rev it out everywhere you go, because everywhere you go, you are revving the nuts off of it, trying to like, <laughs> get it just to go a little bit more. Pedal to the metal, keep it going, keep it going. And this is with downhill gravity assistance brake. Luckily this has upgraded ones because I would not want to see what this thing was like with factory brakes. And thank you very man. Let's see if the horn works. Yay! Cute little British horn. I love it. Rear end rotation basically just happens upon a turn in regardless of how slow it is and then just Go, 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 little bit, little bit. Keep it down. I'm not downshifting as much as I normally would simply because I want to just make sure to maintain this car's <laughs> physical integrity. Anyways, there's fourth gear. Finally into fourth gear and gonna coast down on this upper part a little bit. So like, what do I take away? There's almost nothing to compare this to. Not only is it a right-hand drive car in America and a rare one at that. That was a beautiful little downshift. Not only is it so simple compared to almost anything else you could buy. Not only is it quirky beyond almost every measure imaginable and twitchy and bouncy and loud. This is a car that they made a recipe and they stuck with it for so long, nearly 50 years. There have been car, you know, for instance, car models that have stayed around for 50 years, like the Porsche 911. You've got the Corvette, you've got the Mustang, all of which are beyond 50 years, but rarely do you ever see a car that has maintained so much of its original integrity through, at this point, nearly 40 years of development, and yet it still feels like it's a 1950s car with some bolt-ons. That is why these are special. That is why, like, here in America, you know, it's not ludicrously expensive to import one, but it isn't cheap. You're paying a lot for what is technically a little bit of car, but my God, is it worth it? You cannot experience anything quite like it. As a final note, this isn't even the powerful one. There's also a 1275cc version, which gives you a bit more power and naturally a bit more weight, but I'd, it wouldn't make that much of a difference overall. The experience would still be translated the same. I would definitely highly recommend, if you've never driven an original Mini, if you've never driven a right-hand drive car, or especially both of those together, try it. Most of the, at least most of the owners that me and Gavin have encountered on this shoot love their quirky cars, and I'm sure would be delighted to share the experience, even as a passenger riding what is in the US, our driver's seat, on the wrong side of the road compared to where it would normally be in every single way with all of the compromises the compromises are what make this car an absolutely perfectly imperfect car. Okay, that was a ton of fun. You would have seen maybe one gear crunch right there. It wasn't horrible, but it I was my I am still proud of you, though. I am still proud of you. That is your first right-hand drive experience, and none of that was uh, fluffed up for camera or faked or anything that, like, we turned the GoPro on, you got in the car, and you drove away. Yeah, we hadn't, uh, we, we wanted to do that on purpose. I didn't even want to drive the car until it was literally my first time driving an original Mini and right-hand drive. It was definitely a learning experience. I do fortunately have experience in odd manuals, being that I drive unsynchronized truck transmissions. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> it's still a completely outlandish experience driving something this small on the right-hand side of the road in a right-hand drive car with a small motor. So let's get some quick like specs out of the way for those of you that don't know the size and power that these cars make. So this 998cc Mini right here produced 43 horsepower, 52 pound-feet of torque, weighs roughly 1,340 pounds, um, 0 to 60 
is, we'll say, depending on conditions, trim and body, and altitude. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, yes. <laughs> um, in the 17 to 22 second range, give or take a plethora of factors, even if you packed golf bags in the rear. <laughs> there was, I mean, there is that common joke about cars that are just generally slow anyway, and then zero yep. to 60 and eventually. That's actually pretty true with this one. Yes. Uh, it is eventually, it could be a 17 to 22 second zero to 60. Yep, and then um, four by four by 10 is the size of effectively both of these cars. Mm -hmm. Um, and this one is still running on cone suspension with some slight tweaks and much bigger brakes than stock with four piston calipers and stuff. But other than that, it's relatively untouched, which is kind of difficult here in, in America. And we'll get to that more towards the end of the video. Mm -hmm. But realistically, this is close enough to where we can kind of compare what a 998cc engine mini is like. Right. I mean, th as far as... Uh what a driving experience would be like to anyone else that would really just hop in a 998cc. There's not a whole lot different. I can't imagine there'd be a whole lot of variation in uh, in feel. And especially if it's your first time driving one of those, I feel like this is a really great baseline. Exactly, and I think this fixes some of the, you know, we'll call them quirks of like what a stock original Mini would be like, which is maybe some slightly less than ideal braking, slightly less than ideal grip, because both of these do have a uh, little bit larger rubber than factory as well, and definitely more <laughs> modern <laughs> rubber. You wouldn't um, know it though, because you know, tiny little wheels. And you know, these cars are a hoot to drive. In some of the shoots that, or sorry, some of the shots that you're gonna see throughout this film, you'll notice that these things love to drag tail when they're going around a corner. Mm -hmm. Love to, it is I mean, me too, but you know. Yes, <laughs> but like, you gotta keep in mind, these are front wheel drive cars, but like, because of, the weight distribution, because of the squared stance of the wheel setup, because of where the driver sits, how the power is applied. When you're going around a corner, you're almost always having some lovely, predictable oversteer as you're just flying around. Everything rotates so nicely, it's so easy to handle. And even me as a first timer in the car, dealing with a you know four speed, very oddly placed transmission lever and sitting on the right of the car, in a car where like you can't see too much. We'll go to a wide camera here, but like your legs are like up like this a little bit in most of these. Just that's almost just ergonomically. Well, and your they, wheel is also yeah. over here. Your pedals are also over here. That's what they had to do to make this fit. The pedals are literally shifted probably about four and a half inches to the left, so that the wheel well can fit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's. It's a hilarious and outlandish experience as an American, especially as somebody who's driven the largest end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. semi-trucks, to get in something like this that could fit inside the sleeper of one of my semis and putt around. And it's such an enjoyable thing. When you're in a more original one like this, rather than the 1275 GT car, I won't say what it is yet, that we're gonna talk about later, you have to work so much for your speed, but it rewards you so much around every corner. Overall, with just how predictable it is, it's like most of the car is not that hard to just get in and drive and actually drive pretty spiritedly because it speaks to you so well with the only potential caveat being like, it is a little odd to lend the transmission. It's naturally being the way it's designed. It's a just little a, finicky. It's just a matter of using your left hand instead of your right hand to do what is the same thing. The gears are in the same place as it would be yeah. you know, a US spec car. Um, the steering on these cars is still super direct it's and really communicative. Lovely. Uh, the great. brakes are not too touchy. They're not too heavy, at least in my uh, experience it hasn't been. Yeah, which is good. You kind of have to dive on them. So the pedals also sit kind of more like this than like this, mm -hmm. like in a traditional car. Mm -hmm. So it's really good. You can really dive into the pedal and get a good linear feel yeah. for the braking. Um, and man, it's just, it's it's difficult. Here in the United States, we don't get we these cars. As we said in the intro, we got them for a period from 60 to mm -hmm. 67. But past that point, due to regulations, they weren't here. So finding these cars here is kind of fun. And it gives us, especially with the large canyons and stuff we have here in Utah, mm -hmm. it's a totally different environment than what they were designed for effectively. Oh God, yeah. And <laughs> that's what makes them a hoot when you can yeah. go down a corner in this thing with, you know, let's say like 10 to 15 degrees of inner camber and really get oh, this yeah. big old slide going around. In fact, in the other car, when we were cruising down a canyon, we, oh, I was in the back recording audio on that segment, little tip of the trade there and mm. we're like slightly drifting out the way, all the way through this corner very predictably well, and this crowd of Porsches comes around and so we're like doing this 
big old slide, and I'm on the outside, like, watching these 9-11s Try to stay by. out of frame while also, <laughs> you know, the back end is rotating towards oncoming traffic. But none of it felt unsafe. That's the hilarious thing. Yeah. And especially in the uh, black car right here, it feels even less than unsafe because, again, let's reference back to that figure I mentioned earlier. 43 horsepower. What does 43 horsepower feel like? Um, the answer, I think some would say slow. I wouldn't necessarily say slow, even though it technically is. Um, I it's would say- It's slow when you have an incline at altitude. Mm -hmm. When you're, that's where you're genuinely working for your speed. Driving in a metropolitan downtown sort of area, if your foot is still in it, you know, the, the, it's a four speed. It's not like a really narrow or a short ratio six speed. Yep. So it's not like you're constantly shifting. You, like you're working a little bit more than, you know, other traffic, but it also weighs 1,300 pounds. Mm -hmm. Is it 13? 1340. 1344 yeah. is the official spec. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the car weighs nothing as well, uh, but it's, it's not quick. No. It's, it's, not, it's, the, it's the opposite of quick. It's still 43 horsepower. I would say probably half of the motorcycles on the road have that much at least or more uh motorcycles that are not even that quick uh have about that exactly and but that's what makes it fun with with this specific car you have to really work for it it gives you the enjoyment that we as drivers like of really having to genuinely try for your speed but it doesn't feel overbearing in a car this small it feels natural for mm -hmm. it to be that slow to be honest sure I did realize that we did forget to mention one thing. This is a 1991, which makes it a Mark V Mini, um, but we have been informed that more or less past Mark III, a lot of these are colloquially known in the community as Mark III Plus because they became more iterational and small changes and facelifts and things of that nature. For instance, on the really original minis, the dash was actually a platform, more or less a storage space for all of your belongings with a center um, center speedometer and all the gauges right in the middle. Whereas on these cars, they got they gained a relatively normal dashboard, mm -hmm. all things considered, and that continued on. Um, and so, but a lot of the core components, namely the size and most of the body, stayed the same. So that's why when we say that, you know, it's it doesn't feel like driving a 1991 at all. It feels closer to its origins than it does to anything in 1991. Well, the drive line, uh, the everything that's under the skin of the car is still from the 50s. Yep, still from the 50s with changes and iterations along the way, but the sure. roots are the same. Correct. And correct me if I'm wrong, but actually in this case I know I'm not, luckily. Um, there are very few other cars that can herald a more than four decade long reign with as few changes as these cars. People give the Porsche 911 a hard time for more or less being the same, but these are actually the same for 40 years. Yes, it's very rare. For instance, my Saabs, which lasted, if you count the 99 and 900 turbo, which were relatively the same body with an extended nose between those two, um, even that doesn't come close. No. Because even that ended in 93 here in the States mm -hmm. and started in the early 70s. So it's crazy to think that, in fact, we didn't even get a later model car in this comparison because these are relatively difficult to find here mm -hmm. in the States, all things considered. But this body made it all the way up to the millennia. <laughs> yeah, because you could buy a model year 2000 that mm -hmm. looked like this. It's hilarious. Granted, that one, that's where they really did for the quote unquote Mark VII generation really did add a lot more things in, such as air conditioning and a lot of creature comforts that these cars more or less never had. Right. Um, I mean, in these cars, you gotta think, in these cars, with how cheap they were back in the 50s, you were lucky to get almost anything, like a radio, which didn't happen for quite a while. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Now, the question I think that I had was driving this, after I got a feel for it, I had my fun. It's great to go around corners. It's great to it's great to steer. It's great to drive from the owner's recollection. It's great to own. And th there's lots of goods. Um, we're going to quickly say this car roughly, um, for those of you that may be interested, is like in the U.S. Keep in mind, not anywhere else in the world, because everywhere else in the world, these are plentiful, unlike <laughs> here in the U.S. Well, um, yeah, it's 10,000 versus 5 million. Exactly. <laughs> these are 
roughly ten to fifteen thousand dollars trading hands. If you're looking for like a nine nine eight in let's say driver spec or maybe a little bit better, you'd obviously go a little bit above that figure. But you know, you're talking you're talking a ten to fifteen thousand dollar car, so it's an entry level five digit car. Mm -hmm. So they're relatively affordable. And for the fun that you get for that price range, it's killer. Let's say that you're a person that you like a little bit of power. Yeah. Let's see and also air conditioning. And also air conditioning. And also padded leather seats. Maybe a turbo. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 oh there. Um, let's say that you want those things, maybe even some better brakes from factory. What, what? what would you have done for as a mini owner or a prospective mini owner? Well, what? gee golly, uh, if only there was a company that would provide such features. Um, by happenstance, there very well may have been that. And it very well may be the car sitting to my left or your right. This is a 1989 ERA Turbo. Yes, this has got a snail in it. Back in the day, this made around 94 horsepower. This car, as it sits now with a slightly hotter cam, kind of hopped it up to about 130, which is lovely, especially when it weighs about 1,700 pounds. That's actually up from the 998cc car that Justin just got done driving. It's just more of a nicer place to be, and I'll kind of get into that once we get going here. So back in the day, you could buy an original Mini Cooper when they were, you know, modern and relevant with the 998cc engine. Four cylinder, carbureted, tiny little package that goes in the front of a very tiny car. They didn't weigh much, they didn't, also didn't make a lot of power. You could also buy the sporty version, which was a 1275cc. Basically just a bigger version of the 998. This car is a turbocharged version of the 1275. That said, the turbo was really all of that was added to it. This is a non-intercooled engine, and it's still carbureted. So this car kind of lives in this weird no man's land of turbocharged with a manual boost controller. There's no intercooler, so heat soak is going to be a thing. It just is. And if you want to tune it, you're still using screwdrivers and carburetors. There are a few differences between the ERA and a standard Mini. The 998cc that Justin drove is exactly that. It was 998 cc's. From the factory, it was really more supposed to just be, you know, a, a family hauler that was more compact in size. But for an enthusiast looking at these cars, that it, it, it drives more like a driver-oriented car. You had to really wring more out of it. Uh, they had about half the power that the standard ERA Turbo made while weighing a few hundred pounds or a couple hundred pounds less. It's the porker of the original Mini lineup, as it were, but it also has a nicer interior. The seats are actually a really pleasant, you know, they're, they're padded really well. Uh, the front is actually raked up a little bit to provide for more of a sporty uh, seating position. Uh, I personally find it to be a much more pleasant place to be. If we weren't shooting this today, and if the owner said, yeah, take the car for a week, I would probably take this to California tomorrow. And the great thing about taking a car like this to California is that they have really great roads there, and this can hang with the best of them still. And the thing about this is that the phones are still original mini. So you can still chuck it into a corner at a speed that your, your passenger might not feel totally safe. And uh, you're gonna come out the other end just fine. And both cackling, at what you just accomplished. So this car was made in 1989, which as people who know numbers is still in the 80s. Guess what also was in the 80s? Boost lag. Ah, good old boost lag. Turbo's turning on at 3,500 RPM. <laughs> And it's still a mini, still. <laughs> so I get to shift this four speed gearbox with my left hand, which is always a treat. 
it's always a fun little game to play when you know we as Americans hop on the on the right side, not the correct side, but it's still the right side of the car. So the thing about driving a car like this and a car of this size and shape in 2021 is actually quite interesting because cars have gotten bigger, as we all know. I mean, look at the Porsche 911. Well, I mean, look at the 911 from 20 years ago. I mean, the car is 60 years old now, so look at the car from 20 years ago, only a third of its lifespan, and look at the car now. The, the 992 not, generation 911 is huge, as you would have seen in our video about the car. Uh, they, they absolutely grew in size. It's a lot more difficult and a rarer occasion to drive a 992 911 on a canyon road and be able to make your own line and actually carve out a possible apex. Whereas in the Mini, you can I can take this all the way to the outside of this lane and then I can come all the way here. I mean, I can kind of wander in this. I'm, I'm still in my own lane. So you're not really struggling to maintain a lane and you're not cutting lanes while driving one of these, which is part of what makes this fun. Along with being able to use more of the road, you can also use more of the brakes. We have four piston calipers up front with this, which is lovely. They work fantastically well. They're also an inch lower than with the standard Mini from back in the day. And uh, you get just a, a little bit more performance in the handling department along with you know, the added performance of doubling or possibly tripling the power from a turbocharger. You also might be watching this video and thinking, hey, that car sounds like a lot of fun. I actually might want one of these. It's fun, it's quick, it's fun, it's quirky. Everywhere we go, we even had a Department of Natural Resources ranger come up to us when we were setting up for this shot or for this section of video. And normally when that happens in the Canyon Road and after we've been doing some driving, it's not really a great conversation that proceeds. He just wanted to see the car. He just wanted to talk about it. Be like, hey, like I'm kind of eyeing one of these. And, you know, and then was talking with the owner of the car and wanted to know more about it. Well, the market for ERA turbos, first of all, they didn't make a whole lot of these. They made 436 of them globally. 99 of them actually went to the UK and the others went to Japan which is kind of interesting. Not a, if you don't really know minis and if, are, if you aren't into them, you won't actually know that there is a huge uh, community for uh, minis coming out of Japan or being imported into Japan. So, okay, you want to import one. It's likely they're going to come from Japan. What are you looking at? You know, import taxes and fees and all that stuff. Well, out the door, you're probably looking at a 30 five to forty thousand dollar car you know and that's not an insignificant chunk of change but what do you get with forty thousand dollars you get a car that they only built a few hundred of these ever you're gonna get thumbs up everywhere you go you're also going to get something that is comfortable to drive has air conditioning you get to play the game of you know shifting from this side of the car and driving from this side of the road and you get to play with turbo noises you have a car that has superb handling and that you can just chuck into a corner. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a number going into that corner and things are going just fine. <laughs> that's great. So I actually see a value proposition because if you go back to Porsche, if you spend $40,000 on Porsche, you're like looking at a 997 that like a lot of people have. It, it's a car that drives well, but there's nothing really that special about it. You're spending forty thousand dollars on Ford. In, in, in the in the Ford and Chevy world, you're getting Camaros and Mustangs, which like, yeah, they built a million of those. They built five million original Minis, but they only built four hundred thirty-six of these. I genuinely see a value proposition on something like this. Like, yeah, you shelled out forty thousand dollars and then you get a car that's only this big. <laughs> I understand why some people might not be into that. But there's also 36 millimeter and 38 millimeter watches that are made with precious metals that are $50,000. Just because you buy something that's large doesn't mean you actually got a lot of that thing. It doesn't mean that there's a value proposition there. 
this car is unique. This car is quick enough. It's fun as hell in the corners. You're gonna get looks and thumbs up everywhere you go. And you're you're gonna make somebody's day. And I definitely see the worth in that. And it's gonna make your day because you're gonna be in a corner at 4,000 RPM in third gear, put your foot into it. <laughs> And you're, you're just gonna have a grand old time. Yeah, so finally a Mini that's actually like somewhat quick and kind of livable with like, you know, regular driving pace. You haven't mentioned it in the video, but like we could both imagine actually taking this car on a road trip. I would, it would be intriguing to take this on a road trip as kind of a challenge and it's definitely doable. You're definitely more of an automotive masochist than I am. A little bit. I so like, I'll take yeah. that one, and you take that one, and we'll have a little weekend in Malibu, and you know. Have, I like have the fringe, day. and I like the challenge, which is why this is fun. But this takes comfort. We'll say it on a comfort scale. This is like a three out of ten. It's comfortable enough to drive, and for what it is, it's this is probably six. This is probably a six, because they did so much to this car. Again, let's get some specifications out of the way first. There was only 436 of these damn things made. 436 out of over 5 million cars. The fact that we have one in here right now makes this probably the rarest car officially that we have ever... One, it's up there. Uh, on film, at least, yeah, that yeah. we have ever done. Yeah. It's insane. And what needs to be said, I didn't say it in the film itself, but this one right here is actually uh, de-body kitted, as it were. Uh, it actually looks more like a quote-unquote normal Mini. Mm -hmm. uh, when these came from the factory, from dealerships that did the uh, the install, because they didn't come from Mini that way, they came from dealerships that had, you know, the in with ERA. Mm -hmm. um, this has been deep body kitted. It actually had more of like a, like very much a late '80s tuner, almost Gambala type of body kit on it. Yeah, and this one, so it's got the chrome bumpers. It would normally have some side skirts that would go down the side, mm -hmm. so it has the earlier Mark I taillights, and it's been brought back a little bit. So it doesn't look like an ERA, but we showed you under the hood. It is most definitely an ERA. It's mm -hmm. just been, some would call it molested. I call it, I actually love it. I love the way it looks, but I do understand it is no longer a true ERA because it has been changed. But oh, the reality whatever. is, I think the owner and us can speak for ourselves. The car still drives like an ERA, and it's still fantastic. It drives great. It drives fantastic yeah. the way it is. Um, 99 of those 436 cars went to the UK, 337, including this one, went to Japan. Which is actually quite interesting for a company that's known to be English to ship most of anything to Japan. Granted, I mean, who knows how those, if those were actual decisions or if that's just what happened. But if you look at the way, and again, we'll superimpose this up on screen right here. If you look at the way it did from the factory, you can kind of see why the Japanese tuner culture would have absolutely loved this thing. Well, right, because this started in 1989 and went to 1991. So yeah. that's like right in that time frame when like, you know, R32 GTRs were coming out and like a lot of the really great JDM legends. And the earlier Corollas, the rear-wheel drive ones. Oh, uh, like the 86, mm -hmm. which was in 86. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those cars that we now herald as like JDM icons mm -hmm. were really really heavy and coming out in this era. And I, you know, who knows, that probably played a big part. We don't know, but either way, most of them went to Japan. Um, so we went from, if you recall correctly, we went from a grand total of 43 horsepower to in stock form, 94, and now an, a red line up to 6,200. Mm. But the one that we have here now is up to about 130. 130, yeah. as, as the owner nods offset. Yes. One, around 130, because it's got a new boost controller, it's got a cam, it's got bigger pistons, correct? Forged pistons. Forged, Forged pistons. Forged pistons, not bigger. And a original top speed of 115. It changed the original really little tiny brake calipers on the factory minis to four piston front brakes mm -hmm. with servo assistance. Mm. Mm. Original wheels, and again, I'll clarify, neither of these are running stock wheel and tire setups. However, yeah. it would have come with 13s from the factory. Um, this one does have some more modified suspension than it even came with. However, it was modified from factory, and it had one and a half degrees of tow, so you're sitting there towing, um, oh sorry, tow out, my bad, tow out, um, just to help it bite around corners and mm -hmm. stuff and it knocked the zero to 60 down from 17 to 22, down to 8.8. .8. Blistering. 
It's more than a 60% improvement. <laughs> that, I mean, to be fair, in 89 through 91, 8.8 .8 was relatively respectable. It was quick. It wasn't supercar territory, no. but it was definitely quicker than the mass populace was. Yeah. And with the body kit, the leather, the turbo, and all the other additions, it bumped it up from the 1,344 pounds to 1,624. So actually, if you think about that, it bumped it up about 20 to 25 percent weight. Right. That's a pretty big amount. Luckily, it had the power to cope with it. Luckily, well, and also, also had mid range with it, you know, being a turbo. But you know, yes. that boost also hitting at 3,500 RPM, that old school, you know, almost Porsche 930 turbo style of boost. You know, <sighs> it, it wakes you up. You, like you're, you're got to be paying attention. And so we mentioned the leather in this car. It wasn't just leather. One of the other changes that they made to this was a drastic interior overhaul. Mm -hmm. Co you know, coating the dashboard in more leather-esque materials than before, adding a ton of gauges, which looks awesome. Gauges and wood and even the seating position is different on this, and it's actually a little bit more leaned back, mm -hmm. which is kind of why I thought it would be better for a road trip car. Yep. Because you actually have like more leg room and a more relaxed seating position. And there's definitely more of a normal fit and finish type of feel to this. I would say this interior is closer to what you'd buy in a normal car where it actually has some sound deadening and yeah. uh, you know a couple other little things like that. Yeah. Whereas on the original minis, they're relatively more uh, we'll call them stripper model esque because they need to be to have lower horsepower and to save be weight. cheap and you know, save weight and all those things. So this is a really special car, is what we're kind of getting at. There was a drastic amount of changes done to make all of these things cohesively function as a unit and run. And dear God, did they do some magic. And again, I'm not discounting this at all. This is its own kind of magic. I'm sure. not actually going to say one is better than the other because they are o both their own flavors that both have a rightful place. Well, and we are incredibly spoiled, uh, like Justin and I personally, for having been so lucky to find one of these. I mean, the fact that, you know, out of the five million made globally, we don't even see that many here in Utah to begin with. And Let then alone we, states, you know, like well, in general. You yeah, know? and yeah, then yeah. You, we find, or I, you know, just caught word by somebody else on the street that this thing exists. It's like, we have to film that. We must find this car. We must drive it. We must film it. So we uh, definitely have to thank uh, both owners for sure uh, for providing these cars for us today. Yeah, and... So you take everything that we talked about with the more more original uh, black 998 car, mm -hmm. turn it up to roughly 11, not quite, but turning it up to 11, like really cranking the knob yeah. up. You're cranking up, you know, all the suspension stuff, the factory toe out. You're cranking up the power, mm -hmm. and especially with this making 130 horsepower. Oh my god, this thing is <laughs> such a riot because you can actually keep up with things, actually go up canyon hills, mm -hmm. carve canyons going uphill, not just downhill. Um, with gravity mod, yes, and man, it just makes it so so much of a special car that it even exists. You look in even the engine bay of this 998, you would never think that in that engine bay you'd have you would fit a turbo. You have to be some kind of madman that was maybe just a little too drunk one night and yeah. just looked in there and just, you know what, I've got a mini turbo laying around. What's I, the smallest turbo I have? <laughs> I'm gonna try to find some way to shoehorn that into this thing. Yeah, and you know what? By God, somebody did it. And it was a factory sold car. Mm hmm With like proven reliability from a factory. Yeah, and it does great. And it just, it makes it such a unique experience. Such a unique experience. And I just loved it. He drove it on camera. You can clearly see that he absolutely loved that this car. You can clearly see that it gives a special driving impression that like very few cars do. Well, and, and you talk about the, not just the driving impression, but also uh, the impression that it leaves on other people around you. And you think about what these cars are worth. It's kind of where I'm kind of heading with this. Yes. Um, the smiles per dollar factor is pretty high. With yeah, and, but if, if you still, if, if you look at the that price tag, um, so as you said before, these are roughly 10 to 15, roughly more likely speaking. 12 to 15 probably. Yep. Um, Pre-import, these are probably worth more in like the higher 20s. And then before, uh, if we're talking top dollar, top of the market, import from Japan with import fees, you're knocking on the door of 40. Which uh, he did mention, and we did just want to clarify that. That like, is top of the market. They're generally more uh, closer to 
the lower 30s. So it just really depends on if you find one locally, quote unquote. If you not. find one and it still has the body kit and everything is original and clean and yada yada yada, collector car bullshit. Yeah. Um, if you have all of that, yeah, sure, it might knock on the door of 40. But even at 40 grand, uh, if you look at the cars that you can buy for 40 grand, that are like not all of them can turn as many heads, make you chuckle like a child, um, have the same drama in theater, and also uh, provide that fun uh, right hand drive experience than these, than this at least. Yeah. And this as well. In fact, I think we're going to move on to probably talking about both of these because we've clearly talked a lot about the fact that we love this thing and the fact that it's great, the fact that it's rare. And we've already talked about the fact that this is such a crazy unique experience here in the US, but maybe we need to talk about both because the thing is here in the US, these are not common. They are everywhere else in the world. We get that. Um, they're, they were effectively a Honda Civic, especially in Great Britain, everywhere else. Oh, yeah. They're a normal site. Here, they're not a normal site. So driving either of these on either day, we got so many Well, looks. actually, funny story. So yes. at the very end of filming this ERA Turbo, we were at a gas station. Uh, we had done all of our shooting. We were good to go, uh, go home. And uh, there was a guy, he was probably in his early 20s, and he walks up to us and says, like, hey, man, like this is super cool. And he ended up recognizing us from the Audi film, which was super weird. Which was crazy. So. It was his dad that walked up first and said, hey, my son would love to see it. You know, his, yeah. his son walked up and was like, oh my gosh, I've just never seen one in person. And then we proceeded to tell him what it was. Well, he was a car enthusiast that saw this British racing green mini at a gas station and thought, oh, I should go talk to them. So when he did, I mean, you know, he absolutely loved it. And similar things happened with this car. Now, granted, with this car, we just ended up in a situation where it had our first ever recognition, which was amazing. Yeah which makes the car even more special to us. Yes. But even with the black car, you can't get mad at somebody in a Mini. If, like, typically we'll have some people that might give us a frown for whatever reason in a canyon road. Right. However, neither of these had anything of the sort happen. They, everybody loved them. And we would have people stop and be like, oh, that's so cool. We even had with this one, we, <laughs> we had a big uh, uh, tundra full of, uh, uh, do you remember when they drove by? No. Around the dam. So up in... Which dam? East Canyon? Uh, East Canyon Dam. We had these guys... Actually, you weren't there because you were out filming. Ah! Yeah. So when me and the owner were sitting in this car, um, after we had just filmed the segment, uh -huh. all of a sudden this big pickup truck comes around a corner, and all these guys literally leaning on the window, Oh my God, it's a Mini! It's just <laughs> like freaking out. Probably, you know, definitely not the clientele crowd you would think that would like love a Mini, but... Really. Everybody loves these things. Yeah. It's, well, especially here in America, but I think I could probably say it without saying that a lot of the world, there's a great shared love for them as well. But here in America, being how relatively rare they are, mm -hmm. it's just this cool sight that you don't ever see. You're more likely to see an owner of a Lamborghini or, or a Ferrari right. either on the street or at a Cars and Coffee. There's more GT2 RSs <laughs> at Cars and Coffee than there are of these original minis. You just don't see them very often. And that's not to say the owners don't drive them. In fact, I think out of all the owners that we've talked to in making this, every single one of them gets driven, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't met a Garage Queen one. I'm sure they exist, and that's fine. But the majority of them seem to actually want to actively participate in driving the car and it being out and about and people seeing it. And I think that kind of makes it for me at least because you have this group of eclectic people that have decided that instead of spending let's say 15 to 20 roughly on any 10 year old you know entry level sports car mm -hmm. they chose this yeah and the cool thing about it is they all seem to kind of change them a little bit to their particular taste like mm -hmm. i said neither of these cars are truly stock they're close they're not heavily modified but they all have you know little mods to kind of bring them up to 21st century safety and braking and tires and stuff like that, which mm -hmm. don't take away from the ethos of the car, but they add to the experience. And that seems to be the case with every one because we didn't search that hard, but we also weren't able to find like a truly, completely, 100% original one here in the States. Well, and I would think that if someone had a car in Utah that was completely original, if it was actually like a Cooper S, mm -hmm. Something like that, I don't think that they would actually let us have a go, because those are in now, what, 60? 
Are yeah. aren't those those are pretty high now, aren't the they? The actual Coopers. A 60s Cooper? 40 to, 40 to 6, there's one that sold, uh, bring a trailer for 60. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. The factory racing, quote unquote, racing inspired iterations from the Cooper car company command a pretty heavy value. So instead, you can buy one like this for a relatively low price, spend a few thousand on it, and get pretty close to what the Coopers gave. Obviously, it's not original, but you as a driver don't, you don't give a shit. You're having a ton of fun. That's a mini. No, and it's so cool to see them just like paraded and lotted around, and every single owner seems to just love the hell out of them. Yeah, no, it, it, and seeing that is just the best, honestly. And that's kind of what we try to preach to everybody is you know loving your own car and going out and driving it and enjoying it because that's what they're for. Realistically, that's what matters, and I think that in driving these two cars, that proved it to me more than anything is that. The p type of people that own these cars don't care what anybody else thinks, but the irony is everybody else loves it. It's yeah. fantastic. And I honestly can say that this was among the most fun that I've had driving a car mm -hmm. because of the way that these work and because of what they are. And especially with one of them being as rare as it is and both of them being pretty rare in the States and attracting so much attention, it just absolutely sells the dollar value. Yeah. A thousand percent. It is well paid back in my mind if you spend the money to get one of these. So, as an in, as a group here, we do need to give a couple thanks. We yeah. need to thank the owners. Um, we understand these are rare cars here in the states, especially the ERA. There, this kind of trust is even beyond what we had in the Audi film, because at least in the Audi film, those cars, all of them, could be pretty easily repaired, replaced, and they were all modern. Here. Um, with both of these, even with the more common one, if any incident were to have occurred, it would be a lot more difficult to have done anything. So we need to sh give a huge shout out to thank the owners. And then you've seen this sign that says makes and models behind us. Um, that here in Utah is a local shop and dealership in Central Salt Lake that the owner graciously has given us the presence of this showroom. Thank you. Um, and. That's, it, as you can imagine, it's probably pretty difficult, and it is, to find locations to shoot things like this. We were very fortunate with having that large hangar, hangar style area that we did before. Absolutely, but the, what's involved with doing a shoot like this is finding a place that has space to actually park multiple vehicles, to give space for a camera and a desk and people, and also looks nice and isn't noisy. It's, it's a lot to kind of balance and juggle, so we are, over the moon with uh, the generosity and the hospitality uh, given by the folks here at Mix and Models. So we have, we thank you. Uh, and immensely. if you have any sort of eclectic car that needs, if you want to buy a race car. Yeah, exactly. If you <laughs> want to buy a race car, if you want to come here and get your car serviced, yeah. or I believe they do detailing as well. Correct, Derek. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yes. If you want to get, you know, if you have a car that has needs, this they can service it. Yeah. They're they're fantastic people. We love them to death, and we can't thank them enough. And Definitely check them out, anybody that's in Salt Lake, because yeah. um, obviously we understand we're going YouTube, so there's plenty of people all over. But even if you're looking for your next eclectic car, they have quite the collection of cars for sale that you can come check out. I definitely recommend it. But to be honest, I think it's probably about time that we wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching. You've really all made this something that we can actually physically do now that we're you know, monetized and basically shoots actually pay for themselves. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. How did this happen? How? I don't know. How? But either way, we hope it continues. Thank you all for watching and have a good night.